Friends, happy Easter. There are so many questions surrounding this first preacher, the first Christian preacher, the first apostle, the first prophet of the risen Lord, the first, speaking of course of Mary Magdalene, the first. Mary Magdalene, and We've assumed for so long from her name, Mary Magdalene, it is written in some Bibles as Mary of Magdala. She's from village Magdala. Of course, most of us know today, and I don't need to tell you this, she was not a sinful fallen woman, a sex worker. She wasn't all of these things that the church has made her out to be for centuries. That story about her can be traced back to a sermon. <laughs> it was given by a pope in the seventh century where he took it upon himself to invent a lot of things about her that aren't actually in the Bible. So be careful what you say in sermons. No, um, Mary of Magdala. The problem was that historically there was no village called Magdala. There's no place on the Sea of Galilee. There's no place in the Levant that we know of that carried the name Magdala. Mary of Magdala couldn't have been of Magdala. No record of such a place. But that word, Magdala, it means in Aramaic, a tower. It means the tower. When later, there were towns called Magdala. And in the third and fifth and eighth century, there were such fishing villages called Magdala. They were called that because they had a tower in them, which any sailor can tell you why a seaside town might have a tower. It's for a lighthouse. But no such town existed at the time of Jesus. So why was she called Mary Magdala? There's a theory, it's one that I favor. We know a few things about Jesus. One thing that we know about him is that he loved giving people new names. He did it all the time. He changes Peter's name. He calls him Caiaphas, the rock. He says, from now on, you will be known as the rock, Peter the rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And so the theory states that her name isn't Mary of Magdala. Her name is Mary the Tower, Peter the Rock, and Mary the Tower, the Lighthouse, which seems to make so much sense when you understand the role she plays in today's story. Jesus gives people new names all the time. We receive new names all the time. Any of you who have been baptized have been renamed received a new identity. The entire Christian story is about resurrection and new identities. Today, people get tied up in knots about this stuff, people changing their identities as though it were fixed in stone from birth. As for the Christian, we say, nonsense. Jesus changed people's names. God changed Saul's name. People change their names all the time. Why? Well, why not? The future cannot be known. Who you are in the future cannot be known. Only hoped for in faith. So, with Mary the Tower and Peter the Rock, let us pray. Holy God, on this day of days, on this Sunday of resurrection, May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be pleasing and acceptable unto thee, our guide and our destination. Amen. Well, something happened. Something obviously happened in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is actually a really appropriate place for important things to happen. You know, it's the, it's the land bridge that connects Europe and Asia and Africa. 
If you're trying to move stuff between those three continents, you're going to go through Jerusalem. Incidentally, it's why people have been fighting about who controls Jerusalem for as long as people have been fighting. It's a very important location. This, uh, this stole that I'm wearing was made in Jerusalem, given to a young minister who was in Jerusalem in the 1940s. And he gave it to me uh, when I was ordained. And when I'm an ancient wizard, I'll probably give it to some other poor young fool preparing to step into a life of pulpit ministry. But something happened in Jerusalem And the evidence is that we have a great deal of writing about it. The challenge for the Christian is that the writing that we have is based on oral traditions. It's based on people's recollections and memories of stories. We don't have an impassive observer who was carefully writing down every single thing that happened. We know this for a fact, without a doubt. In the Bible, there are stories that took place. There are conversations between individuals where there was no one else in the room. A very famous one, as Bart Ehrman points out, happens between Jesus and Pilate. The conversation between Jesus and Pilate is recorded in the Gospels. But there was nobody else in the room with them when they were talking to each other. So the stories are based on recollections. And something so important happened that they wrote Gospels about it. Now we know today that we have four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them we call the synoptics. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic is a $10 word that means they take the same view. Syn, optic, sign, the same. Optic is view, the same view. And then we have John, who's kind of their... Funny cousin who lives in Colorado. John's got his own view. These are all hindsights. Hindsights. Well, they say hindsight's 2020, right? Foresight is zero, zero. I have absolutely no idea what the opposite of 2020 is. There's probably an optometrist out there right now losing their mind. <laughs> Hindsight's not 2020. None of us remember the things that happened in our past as clear as though we were recording them in the history books. Most people either have a very rosy view of their own past as it occurred, or they assume that they were the main character and everybody else was a supporting actor. All four of our Gospels are remembrances of the things that occurred, shared by the people who heard about them from the people that they happened to. This is important. Because all four of them seem to agree, for the most part, on the events that took place, but also because they were attested to by our ancestors, the people who came before us, who lived before us. It was important enough It was important enough to them that they desperately wanted them to be given to us. Now, in addition to Mary, Mark, Luke, and John, there are probably some very clever folks out there who know that there are other Gospels that we didn't put into the Bible. The people at the Council of Nicaea started that conversation, never really wrapped it up, we ended up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. By the latest uh, account of the number of other Gospels that were written, there were at least 43 of them. We put four of them in the Bible. Now, there may be 43 other Gospels, but if you start reading them, you're going to realize pretty quickly that uh, most of them are obviously trying to sell us something. Typically, they're trying to insert somebody else into the story as the main character. Typically, it's some other religious leader, some other Johnny-come-lately who wants to tell the story as though they were there. I mean, it doesn't make them accurate. I mean, remember, you, you still get a ring even if you lose the Super Bowl. So don't, don't read the other Gospels as though they're the, the truth. 
I think that based on history and research, the Gospels of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene probably should have been included. But we have this story, we have this testimony, this thing that says something happened. We don't quite understand it. We can't quite comprehend it. It's told in subtly different ways. But something critically important happened on that morning. And lacking words, lacking words, lacking the precision of human language, we have to write it down and we have to tell it to our children. The gospel authors are, all of them, desperately trying to communicate one thing. Last week we talked about that question. Who do you say that I am? The question that Jesus turns to us and asks us again and again and again. Who do you say that I am? And the authors of the gospels are trying to tell us something. And you can see them grasping for language that isn't there searching for words that can't be spoken. They're trying to convince us of some kind of ancient wisdom. And it comes to us from languages, translated through languages. It comes to us words spoken in Aramaic and then translated into Hebrew and Greek and then translated again into English and then read on the page. It's like Morse code being tapped out from the engine room in a submarine sitting at the bottom of the ocean. What is it? Words hastily scratched on a piece of paper, handed through the broken panes of a window of a a burning building, or tucked into a bottle and corked, and thrown into the ocean. And if the ocean is the future, and we are the ones that find that bottle. The words are as close as I can understand them, and as best as I can decipher, after having tried for many, many years, is that we do not have to be afraid. As close as I can understand the testimony of Mary, it is that we have nothing to fear, but that most importantly, we no longer have to fear death. Something happened. He did something. He changed something. It was not a thing that happened inside time but he reached around time or through it or outside of it. And he moved, he moved an integer from one side of the arithmetic to the other. He fundamentally altered some kind of natural law in a way that we can't put into words. And the planets changed in their orbit or the The stars changed in their courses, the seasons in their fashion. Something happened. And we no longer have to be afraid. This is a very hard thing for humans to do. Human beings are designed, programmed to predict the future. We all think we know what's going to happen. There was a time when you could open a newspaper and it would tell you all of the things that had happened in the previous week. We don't have those newspapers anymore. All we have now is what they call analysis. It's just the stuff that's going to happen in the week to come. It's what we should expect. It's what's about to happen, what you should prepare for. And none of us know what that is. Nobody knows. At least I've never met anybody who knows. But we love it. We love to play the game of traveling into the future, predicting what's going to happen. How many times in my life have I met a distraught adult caring for a young person, and the young person has done done something, made a mistake, and the adult sees 
the entire future course of that young person's life laid out before them as this path of misery and darkness based on this one mistake. But we never know. We can't know. The one thing that the universe seems to tell us is that we can be certain that death wins. And the one thing that the people who gave us this book desperately want us to know is that that's just not true. Death loses. There have been many attempts to apply logic to this story. For those of us living in America in the year 2024, the theology of the American Christian Church is dominated by something that we call penal substitutionary atonement. It's a legal theory that says that we sinned and so God wanted to punish us. And then right as God was handing down the verdict, uh, Jesus walked in and said, no, punish me instead. And God was like, okie doke, and went with that. And I think probably a first year legal student could tell you that that doesn't work. You can't go into the courthouse during sentencing for some criminal and walk in and say to the judge, punish me instead of him. And the judge will be like, okay, uh, life in prison for you, I guess, so you get to go free. It, it doesn't make sense. That has been a minority view of the events of the cross and the resurrection for the history of the church. For much of the life of the church, we've held that the message of Easter is one of victory over the grave. It's in our hymns. We sing it if you pay attention to the words that we just sang together. It is that God goes into death, defeats death forever, and then the resurrection is proof of this. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we no longer have to fear death because it's been defeated. We think we know the future. We think we know the arithmetic of death. We who with certainty have decided that we know the fate of every atom. We have such astounding knowledge of the nature of the cosmic mind that we can bind the being into the singular and reduce everything. In, in, in 1975, somewhere in central Utah, there was a massive forest of aspen trees, 100 acres. And in 1975, they counted those trees because it was a lot of aspen trees. And there were 45,000 trees in that forest of 100 acres. And we knew that there were 45,000 trees in that forest in central Utah because we counted. Listen. In 1975, there were a 100 acre stand of aspen trees in central Utah that numbered over 45,000. That's a lot of trees. And then, the very next year, in 1976, Jerry Kemperman and Burton Barnes counted again and checked. And they discovered that there was 100 acres in central Utah that didn't have 45,000 aspen trees in it. It had one. It had one tree with 45,000 different trunks. And now, today, we call it pando. It's just a Japanese word that means I grow. It is the largest living thing on Earth. It is one aspen tree. And so, though we can count, and though we can assume that we know, and we can see, and we can presume to have all of the knowledge in the world, we get it wrong. We get it wrong. And we can stare death in the eyes and go through the darkest moments of our lives. And we can assume that tomorrow will be darker than today and the day after that worse and worse until finally a day of darkness that assumes and consumes all of the other days. But the prophets from Mary Magdalene to today are desperately trying to tell us that it isn't so that we're assuming things that aren't true. 
and that death doesn't win. Well, if we know anything is true about God, we know that which is most present to the creator because it's the thing that exists. The treasure, the one thing that God loves, the most precious thing to God is life. Unexpected, improbable, hovering in the great darkness of space on this pale blue dot is life, an absolute miracle. You see it whenever you look at another human being. You see life. That thing is so precious to God that God would go into death and defeat death forever to preserve it and save it. And that is you. You are alive. You are so incredibly precious to God that today we discover God has done the one thing that we assumed was impossible. God has taken death off the table. Now we don't have anything to fear anymore. Hallelujah. Amen.